Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight is the third part of this reading of the wonderful 1914 lecture by F. de P. Castells, The Arithmetic of Freemasonry. Tonight's section refers specifically to the metrology of the craft. Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic Law. I have undertaken to say something of the metrology of the craft, and I will proceed to do so because it is a subject that stands closely allied with our arithmetic, but time compels me to be brief. The length measures mentioned in the ritual are five, the two modern ones, the inch and the foot, the two ancient ones, the hand breadth and the cubit, and one which is very ancient, although not a familiar one, the cable's length. The word inch comes from the Latin uncia, meaning one twelfth part of anything, and in this connection it indicates a twelfth part of a man's foot, which was early adopted as a length measure, being of course standardised everywhere. But in the ritual, a 24 inch gauge is used as emblematic of time. When the worshipful master gives the entered apprentice his tools, he says that the 24 inch gauge represents the 24 hours of the day, and it may be used in two ways, to graduate his task and to divide each passing day so as to allow of his attending to everything his devotions, his regular employment, and the discharge of his social obligations. As the fingers of the hand have played an important part in the development of the art of counting, so too they supplied the basis for the art of mensuration all over the East. All the high metrical values consisting of so many palms or hands breaths, which like the foot had to be standardized. In the explanation of the second tracing board, we learn that the outer rim of the twin pillars of the porchway of King Solomon's temple was a hand's breadth in thickness. This statement agrees with the first book of Kings, chapter 6, verse 15. Elsewhere, Jeremiah 52, verse 21, we read that it was four fingers thick, and so I shall point out that in this there is no real contradiction, because the hand's breadth of the ritual is to be understood as being not the breadth of the open or extended hand, but that of the back of a clenched hand, in which only four fingers are seen. Theoretically, the cubit was the length of a forearm, from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger, but unfortunately, as each nation adopted a different standard, we find a great deal of variety in cubits. Indeed, some nations had two or three sorts of cubits according to the objects that had to be measured. This may explain the confusion and the controversy that there has been as to the actual length of the cubit employed in designing King Solomon's temple. In Egypt, there were two different cubits, the short, which was one of six, and the royal, which was one of seven palms of hand breadths. In Babylonia, there were three measurements known by that name, one of three palms, used in measuring fine decorative work and gold ornaments, one of four palms, which was used ordinarily for all masonry work, and one of five palms, which was used in measuring land spaces. By the recovery of two scales of linear measurements engraved on the statues of Gudia, nearly 5,000 years old, we have found that these three cubits equaled 10.8, 14.4 and 18 inches respectively. Some archaeologists argue that both King Solomon's temple and in the tabernacle, all three cubits of ancient Babylonia were used. On this calculation, the thickness of the pillars 
would be equivalent to 3.6 inches of our present day measure. Although even now, we cannot be quite certain. Finally, about the cable's length. When this expression is now used by sailors, they mean to indicate a distance of about 100 fathoms, or the tenth part of a nautical mile. But as used in the ritual, at least a cable's length from the shore, it means a distance equal to the length of a coil of cable, which has always been understood to be 120 fathoms, that is to say, 720 feet. The idea is that being buried in the sands at the bottom of the sea at that distance from low water mark, as a minimum, the remains of a traitor might be considered to be definitively consigned to everlasting disgrace, and therefore as having absolutely perished. No trace or remembrance being any longer conceivable. This cable's length must not be confused with the length of my cable toe, mentioned in another part of the ritual. This latter being a figure of speech intended to convey the idea of one's ability to execute an acknowledged obligation. The power to fulfill one's own responsibilities in life. The introduction of the cable into the ceremonies may appear strange, but apart from other considerations, if we only bear in mind the way the cable has been manufactured from time immemorial, we shall recognize that it is a very suitable emblem for the threefold cord which is not easily broken, of brotherly love, relief and truth. In a book compiled nearly 100 years ago, there is a description of it. Every cable, of whatsoever thickness it be, is composed of three strands, every strand of three ropes, and every rope of three twists. The twist is made of more or less threads according as the cable is to be thicker or thinner. The ritual anticipates that after this life, every master mason shall be decently interred. But the penalty of our, our obligation in the third degree involves the very opposite of that idea. I shall therefore close this lecture with a few words on the dimensions of the grave of the third degree and their significance. I have spoken of fathoms, saying that a cable's length equals 120 fathoms, but the fathom is not named in the ritual. It may be defined as the measure of a man's embrace, fixed for all practical purposes at six feet, and therefore, although not expressly named, it is the length of the grave which the trusty fellow crafts of our traditional history are said to have prepared. It was from a centre of three feet east and three feet west. This is an unusual form of expression, but we may account for it by observing that the navel is regarded as lying in the centre. Remember where the master mason rests his squared hands when he stands to order. The navel is our link with the past, and inasmuch as being buried, the body returns to the bosom of our common mother, the old link is very properly viewed as the central point in the grave. The width of the grave between north and south was three feet. These dimensions are still the ordinary minimum dimensions of an adult's grave at the present time. But in the ritual, they are given for a practical purpose, being emblematic. As the area was one of 18 square feet, six by three equals 18, nine to the east and nine to the west, and as the depth was a minimum of five feet, the total capacity of the grave was of 90 cubic feet which is the number by which we define the square, an angle of 90 degrees. The cubic measurement of the grave, therefore, is but another way of representing the square. By being laid under the sod, back to the bosom of Mother Earth, we come into the closest possible fellowship with one another, and the depth of five feet harmonizes with our five points of fellowship. In assigning such dimensions to the grave, therefore, the ritual may be said to bring our symbolism into the reign of death, and we, by endorsing and adopting its provisions, are testifying to the fact that the bond which unites Master Masons in this life is not broken when we are let down into the tomb of transgression. 
Having ordered our life according to the square, we take that sign with us to the grave, and we may rest assured that when we finally rise from the last resting place, the same old sign will procure our admission into the Grand Lodge above, where the world's great architect lives and reigns forever. For more Masonic podcasts, videos, music, texts and artwork, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook accounts by searching From the Quarries. Thank you.